Yeah, so uh, like Stuart said, I'm at Utah Street Labs right now, which is kind of funny because I don't think we've called it. That is the name of the company, but uh, we're building a site called copious.com, and at this point, um, we just kind of call it that. Um, so my story today has four acts. Um, I, my initial idea was to make it kind of a This American Life thing, but uh, that seemed a little kind of like trying too hard. So I, I dialed it back, but I kept the act thing, and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, the the uh, names of the acts have something to do with each of the acts, so hopefully uh, it'll be interesting. So uh, act one is called web scale. Uh, and <laughs> I see uh, there, the people who are clapping, you get what I'm talking about. Uh, the people who aren't, don't worry about it. It's really not worth it. Um, <laughs> So, like I said, I work for a company called Copious.com. We're building a social marketplace. Um, we have t-shirts that I'm actually pretty proud of. Um, it's like the first company I've worked at where I'm really excited about the t-shirt, because it's giraffes, and that's kind of cool. Um, and this is the site as of yesterday. Um, as you can see, we have a lot going on. Uh, the core mechanic of the site is people buying and selling things to each other. It's a marketplace. Um, so, one of our users, uh, Pamela Joyce Designs is selling this $700 glitter art Jimi Hendrix poster. Um, and uh, she has 7,000 followers. The core domain model is something like Twitter, but with stuff in the mix. So rather than just following people, you can also follow things. Um, you can follow collections of things. Um, so there's lots of stuff you can do. You can like things. You can comment on things. You can buy things. Uh, you can unfollow people, or you can follow and unfollow people. Um, down at the bottom, we've got, down below where the page got cut off here, uh, we've got this share thing, so you can also share things. So it's, it's a pretty large collection of activities you can take on the site. Those activities are aggregated, um, turned into stories about activities, um, and then aggregated into feeds. Um, the feed is, at this point, uh, kind of the core experience of Copious in the same way that the news feed is the core experience of Facebook. Um, this is where we drop people at the, the end of the onboarding process. This is where people go when they're logged in by default. Um, and it's another place where people can take lots of actions on the site. Um, based on using the internet, um, I think this is pretty common. You know, a, a lot of sites on the internet, no matter what their domain is, uh, are incorporating these social mechanics. And when people talk about social, I think this is what they mean. Um, you can take lots of actions on the site, they interact with other people, um, and, and a core part of the experience is those interactions with other people. It's no longer just about your content, and it's no longer just about what your site does. It's, it's about how your site connects you to other people. Uh, okay, cool. Cool, so I'm a user on our site. I can follow people. I can follow, and I'm sorry for the transition, it's just so awesome, the flame thing. <laughs> it was just, I was looking through transitions and I had to use it. Um, you can follow things, and this is a, a t-shirt on the site. You can go buy it today, so just saying. Um, and when you're interested in people, we assume that you are interested in the things they're selling. So this guy has a cool leather jacket and a cool pair of sunglasses. You can buy those too. Um, although I think the sunglasses sold, so you can't buy that but you can still see stories about it, which is another interesting thing. Actions are turned into stories, which are aggregated into feeds. Um, and like I said, that's a, kind of a key thing. Um, this particular feed actually doesn't look too dissimilar from what might be in my feed. I see stuff about Rob, I see stuff about uh, Brad, um, and so that's good. So the main thrust of this talk is gonna be about how this works. Um, how we take these actions, this huge stream, this fire hose of activity on the site, and turn it into feeds. It's a fairly tricky problem. Um, I think it's, it, it can seem easy at the outset, but you know, once you start thinking about the numbers involved, when a single action comes in, we have to look at all of our users, figure out who's interested in it, um, and, and stick it in their, their feeds. Um, there are a few other wrinkles in, in our particular system that, that made it even more complicated. Um, and you are occasionally in a position where you need to look through a large collection of old actions, things that happened before on the site, and figure out how to build a new feed for that person. Um, so 
when we started building this system, we had a few MongoDB instances in production. So we said, well, let's use this tool that we are already somewhat familiar with, both uh, you know, at a programming level and at an operational level, and see if we can make the problem fit in that domain. And initially, it seemed like, yeah, we could. We could actually model it pretty cleanly. So the first thing we did was we stuck, we stuck uh, actions into MongoDB as basically JSON documents. Um, not technically true, but um, good enough for, for what we're doing. Um, embedded in those JSON documents, we kept a list of interested users. So if a new action flowed into the site, we would look up who might be interested in that at that time and stick their user IDs into a document within that action. When we wanted to um, build a feed and serve a feed to somebody, when somebody logged into the site, we would uh, do a query for that user ID and get the stories back. Cool. It worked at first, um, and, and in development and in test, and even in production for a little while. Um, but it ended up falling over pretty quickly. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to go too deeply into MongoDB because we're not in a Mongo conference. But um, to make a long story short, uh, Mongo stores basically JSON documents in a structured way uh, and, and lets you do things like query over the internal structure of those JSON documents, which is cool. It's interesting, except that it falls over in unexpected ways. So one thing that just blew up immediately was that growing these interested embedded docs can actually lock the database, which, I mean, and I don't mean like to, for writes, I mean for reads, and I mean on like the slaves and the whole thing, because what happens is uh, they grow pretty big. Um, and when I say big, I mean, we deployed this, and we have this community manager, Caitlin. And she, uh, basically, from when she started, had something like 70,000, well, 30,000 to 70,000 followers, because we stuck her in the onboarding process. And she was like Tom from MySpace. Um, you know, everybody follows her. And I am 100% certain, after going through this, that Tom from MySpace uh, alerted those MySpace guys to a lot of scaling problems way before they would have had them otherwise, because that's what Caitlin did for us. So when Caitlin did something, we would suddenly have this, this document with like 40,000 IDs in it. Um, and then what's worse is when somebody followed Caitlin, we would look up all the, the stories, like the recent stories or something like that. We've tried to block some of this out of our cultural memory. But um, we'd look up all those things, and we'd, we'd add stuff. Um, when those in, embedded docs got too big, they would just explode. Um, we also query sometimes required scanning through the embedded doc, which anybody who's ever watched a table scan happen in a MySQL database will understand that's, um, that's just not going to be good. Um, the query optimizer also made some, some pretty bad decisions when trying to do this. Um, and the net result was that when this was operational, we were like just straight up failing to serve 10 to 20 percent of requests because they were timing out or because there were errors or whatever. So um, that was not really ideal. So we need a new approach. Act two, set theory. So we, st we stepped back from the problem just a little bit and thought about the domain. So what are we doing? We have sets of stories about people and listings. And feeds are the unions of those sets. Um, we union along interest lines. So when we want to generate a feed, we figure out which sets people are interested in by looking at their interests. And we union those together uh, to make a feed. So when I was putting together this slide, I was like, so we thought about you know, what technology is good at working with sets. And I was like, relational databases do this whole thing. Um, but that was not the decision we made. Um, <laughs> I feel like that's the punchline of 90% like of operational uh, talks these days. But um, we actually ended up going with a, a server called Redis. And um, if anybody's not familiar with Redis, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's like, well, you have a problem where you'd like to use C data structures because they're really fast, but you don't want to write your whole system in C. So what you do is you use a, a server that basically provides C data structures over a network interface. It's pretty cool. And one of the data structures that they have is uh, a, um, a sorted set. They have sets, sorted sets, lists. Um, we took advantage of these sorted sets and sets pretty heavily. So. What we did, this is kind of like a hard to see um, uh, 
illustration of, of the model that we had in, in uh, Redis. The top thing there, the interest thing, is a set. It's a set of interests. Um, the, the actual things we stored in the set were just strings. T42, tag 42, L32 was listing 32, um, and we also had actors, so like actor 17. Um, those essentially served as pointers, not literally in Redis, we had to resolve them ourselves, but pointers to story sets. Um, we tagged the story, uh, you know, the string stories onto the beginning of the interest, and then we'd uh, issue a command to go take a union. So, like I said, the client got the interest for a particular user, went down, uh, took the union of those sets, and then produced a feed. So, the idea here, the initial idea was that we could do this at runtime. Um, essentially, when somebody wanted a feed, we'd go and do a build and, uh, and then return it to them. We anticipated that this might be slow sometimes. These union stores would be slow in some edge cases, like uh, if we wanted to build uh, a feed of somebody who had followed you know, 7,000 things, and some of our users, I swear to God, logged onto the site and just followed everybody they could. And I, I don't understand what they were doing, but they, they had 7,000 followers, like, or 7,000 people they were following, and like 15,000 likes, and it, was, it, it uh, made for some slow unioning. We anticipated that, and we said, okay, cool. If this union store takes too long, if unioning that set take too, takes too long, store it in, in Redis, and we'll maintain it when new stories come in. It's not really super scalable, but it, we were hoping it was scalable enough to get us kind of past the next six months. Um, it was not at all. Um, so, you know, this is the initial idea. When a new story comes in, we add it to the, the manage sets. Uh, this this operation is pretty slow because we have to actually go to our MySQL database and say, hey, who might be interested in the story? And then we have to go find the feeds that need updating, and then we stick them in the feeds. Um, what was cool is that initially, this took like 20 megs of RAM. Redis stores everything in RAM and writes stuff out to a dump file eventually. And, and it was like, it was, it was just genius um, until, oh well. So yeah, the Ruby client did all the heavy lifting. We were, pushed some work to the background with Rescue, and then we broke Redis. Uh, so like I said, predicated on the idea that setting users we always use fast. So it just exploded almost immediately. Too many interests meant we were uh, pointing to too many story sets. Too many story sets meant slow union ops. Unions ended up being almost always slow. It was our fault. We were blatantly misusing the, the technology. Um, there were many managed feeds. Management was super expensive, and it, it just didn't, it failed to serve feeds. So, bummer. <laughs> um, so we need a new approach. Act three, the many-armed demon. And I don't know if you can see that. That's, I like Rich's GitHub gravatar. And I grabbed that demon from some kid on the internet, and I don't know. If, if you're watching this video, kid, I'll give you 200 bucks for your thing, or whatever. Um, I felt a little bad about like the copyright thing, but then it was, it was yesterday, so. Okay, so feeds can't be built enough, fast enough at runtime. We just decided that's, that's done. So the, the new solution is to maintain all the feeds in Redis and just own that. We need to be really good at it. It's gonna mean a ton of RAM usage, um, but you know, that's, that's storage. We can pay for storage and we can deal with that for a little while. So what we did was we, uh, well, first off, we thought, hey, can we write this in Ruby? And we decided, no, that's kind of crazy because we needed to be really performant. Um, we're probably, there's lots of potential parallelism in the system, um, and, and just doing that is gonna be problematic. Um, the reason we thought about Ruby is because we use Rails, so everybody in the team knows Ruby, and it's kind of nice to keep things in that um, stable. But I like Clojure a lot, and I was kind of excited about a project to use it, and we were already using it for some of our data warehousing with Cascalog, so. It was a natural fit. So we have a closure, we wrote a closure daemon that reads from rescue. Uh, it updates these interest sets, it updates story sets, and it updates feeds. Essentially everything is a managed feed now and we decide uh, what to stick in what feeds and all that uh, right at runtime. We also had a new requirement. Um, we were doing a big press push and uh, uh, the feeling from the people who were doing the press push was that it looked ridiculous to have uh, multiple copies of items in the feed. Um, so we needed to get this out on a particular deadline, um, and it needed to uh, 
roll stories up into other stories. So if somebody likes 130 things, you don't want 130 things showing up in someone's feed and just flooding the feed. We have a couple big sellers who uh, list uh, in bulk, and so they would just flood the feed with all of their stuff, and it was kind of annoying. Um, we also would digest along other lines, not just a single person doing uh, uh, a bunch of things. Um, we would also say, you know, Jim and John loved this one thing, and Jim loved and shared, so we took multiple actions against another thing, or Jim and John loved and shared cool sunglasses, so multiple people did multiple things. Um, this digesting actually turned out to be one of the harder problems in general to solve and one of the bigger operational headaches. Um, the problem is that digesting is, is somewhat complex and it's, there's no server, there's no database that just does it for you. Um, it's possible that we could have come up with some clever scheme to use some database, but um, it didn't come to us within the like two minutes that we, <laughs> it wasn't two minutes, it was like a day that we spent trying to think about this and trying to figure out what we were gonna do. So what we decided to do was just maintain the head of each feed, the last six hours of every single feed in memory. And I told someone last night at the bar that we were using 50 gigs of RAM in, in, a, in a machine in EC2, and, um, and the, this is why. So that's the, kind of the punchline. Spoiler alert. So we took the head of each feed, we stuck it in an atom, and we uh, kept it in memory. When new stories came into the, come into the system, we add it to each feed and then we write the feed out to Redis and uh, clients read from Redis. Um, if you haven't used atoms before, they're real simple. They are one of the state mechanisms that Clojure provides. Um, the semantics are dead simple. You have an atom, you deref it to get the actual data structure it contains, um, and then you can update it using this swap function. Um, the actual underlying implementation is such that uh, you don't worry about how that function is applied. And I, I'm 99% sure that function might actually be applied twice, so you have to be a little bit careful, but um, like it can't be stateful, it, can't, it shouldn't do things with other systems. Um, but it was ideal for what we wanted. Uh, and essentially, uh, it, it let us turn the parallelism of the system way up. Um, it was, so how'd this work out? It was slightly dangerous to process multiple actions off the rescue queue that uh, we were reading from, that this, rest, this demon was reading from at once because we didn't want to get into a situation where we didn't really know what was, in the, what was currently going through the system. It made it harder to shut down. Um, and it was just a single demon anyway, so we didn't want things interrupting each other. Long story short, tons of bottlenecks. Um, initial feed builds, story ads, interest ads were all in the same process. There were some ways we could work around this. We didn't need them all to be in the same process necessarily, but once you start thinking about that, it, I mean, the problem starts getting bigger, and, and, uh, and so we didn't necessarily want to build that all ourselves. So we needed to make it as fast as possible. That was the, the fastest way to victory. Um, just figure out how we can make this single daemon process things off this queue as fast as possible. Fortunately, our machine had tons of cores, and Clojure has these atoms, which let us maintain state in a way that uh, means we can throw more threads at it with a minimum of effort. Uh, so what we did was we broke up, we broke this daemon up into a few little pieces all in different threads. We have one thread that just sticks stuff into new feeds. We have another thread that goes through an expires feed so we don't have to have that particular logic in line in the story processing. And then we have another thread that actually just looks at this data structure inside the atom. Um, it, it essentially gets a snapshot of the atom, it writes it all out to Redis, and then it just does it again, and it just keeps going and writing. And the reason this worked, and the reason adding this and breaking this up into several pieces uh, was essentially trivial, was that uh, uh, Clojure ha it has a very considered approach to state, um, and, and it really paid off. I mean, this, this was where I felt all those years of reading about Clojure and all the state stuff, and I was very excited. Um, we made one optimization. Uh, we actually, instead of having one giant atom, we broke it up into one atom that contained essentially pointers to other atoms um, so that each of those processes could just work on a single feed at a time and it wouldn't run into a, a, a situation where it was frequently trying to update this massive data structure and conflicting with somebody else who was also trying to update the, the data structure at the same time. So yeah, 
daemon working on multiple things. Closure was awesome for this. It was, it was really good. Um, considered approach state really paid off. Um, it, more than once, I went in and looked at a function, and I added p to the beginning of map, and it just went 10 times faster. And it was like, <laughs> OK, that, that, <laughs> that's a good day. Um, so I didn't hate that. So problems? Are we good? Can we, can we go home? Yeah, there were problems. Storing all the feeds in Redis memory um, was super expensive. Um, it's just, I mean, like, we have these enormous Redis machines sitting in AWS, and the kind of machines that have 50 gigs of RAM in AWS are not particularly cheap. Um, feed builds are only mostly fast, so you can't really rely on them for onboarding. They get stuck behind um, story creation, and sometimes story creation can be really slow because uh, when a new story comes into the system, we have to go and load all of the feeds that, are inter that might be interested in that story from Redis. And it turns out that when you try to load like 100,000 things from Redis at once, and like they're not really small things, it, it's just not super, super fast. Um, so uh, it was hard to, I mean, we did rely on them and do rely on them for onboarding, but it, it's, it's a cagey proposition and not really something that, it, it was just gonna get worse. It's also not at all robust if the daemon breaks, or needs to like take a 60 second GC nap. Um, it, it's just, there's nothing you can do. We, this happened a couple times, it got close. There was this one hilarious instance where we transitioned from line one to line two and the, the profiles changed and uh, the, the uh, JVM arguments that we were using were actually in the old style profiles and we forgot to get them into the new style profiles so we went from using like 50 gigs of RAM to like 20 or something and um, it ran for a month and then just started garbage collecting like a maniac, and we had no idea what was going on for a, a day. That was not awesome. Um, we also had this weird denormalization of data that didn't seem totally necessary. Um, we already have all of the interests. They already exist in MySQL databases, the main MySQL databases that serve the site, um, and we're like denormalizing them into these Redis systems. I mean, that's a way to make things fast, and it wasn't bad, but it was, it was I mean, not super ideal. Also not very extensible. So, I mean, it, it kind of worked for this, but how do we add new things to somebody's feed even though they aren't following them? You know, we, we look at your Facebook profile and we say, oh, I see you're interested in horses. You haven't specifically followed this person listing a horse for sale, but I think you might be interested in it. Um, there's just no mechanism to do that, and, and thinking about sticking some sort of online machine learning thing in the middle of this, this pipeline, uh, it wasn't super appealing and points to a larger problem. How do we make this processing smarter and smarter and smarter? There's just, it, it's all bad. It's all in the, the, the hot path and it just doesn't really work out. Um, tons more parallelism possible in the system. Uh, interest ads, story ads, feed builds, they're all basically independent processes. So how do you get more parallelism? You break things up into smaller chunks. You take advantage of more machines. Um, you build a system of queues and workers. Do we build our own? Build something on top of Redis with like workers, or uh, rescue, um, with workers reading off rescue queues and then sticking them on other rescue queues? Um, I mean, sure, yeah, that sounds like fun, but no, like, <laughs> I mean, you'd need to be like half insane and half a genius to build a robust, high quality system like that in the middle of a you know, startup environment where you, you just need to be shipping something. We just need to get something out so we can move on to the next thing that is completely broken with our site. Um, fortunately, someone already walked that route and did exactly that, and uh, uh, so that's great. Um, uh, Nathan, I don't know if he's here, he was talking at a thing in San Francisco last night, but uh, we'll see, um, has built a couple of really impressive pieces of Clojure software, um, Cascalog, uh, which is a Hadoop uh, abstraction that lets you use like data log on top of Hadoop, it's pretty cool, and uh, a little piece of software called Storm. Um, so, Storm is cool. I mean, I'm still in the like in love phase with it, and, and I haven't we haven't logged a ton of production experience. So, talk to me in six months, and maybe I'll be cursing it in the same way that I, I cursed Mongo at the beginning of this. But um, it's it's a pretty interesting piece of software, um, and it introduces a, an interesting abstraction on top of, of parallel processing. So here's the basic idea: you have spouts bolts, 
streams, tuples, serialization, and deserialization. Basically, these sort of beige things are computational units. The, the, the greenish black things are um, network connections between those computational units. Um, and there's serialization and deserialization done uh, on the, the blobs of data that you're throwing around. Tuples are just arbitrary bags of data. Um, you can access them positionally or by name. Um, and you can store anything in them, um, modulo, whatever serialization you're willing to write. Um, if you can write a, a cryo serialization, cryo is a Java serialization library for your data type, then you can include it in a tuple and you can set it, send it between nodes. All sorts of things you can serialize and deserialize, um, and it's essentially arbitrary. Um, and that's, that's it. it. It's actually kind of like the core unit of data in this thing, and it's, that's it. We have these spouts. Spouts uh, pull external sources. They emit tuples. They acknowledge successful processing. Um, it has a hook, essentially, to tie into whatever queuing system you're using. And it handles failure. It enables reliability. Uh, it has an API that's specifically built to allow you to build a, a, a reliable system that guarantees message processing. Um, which is something we didn't even like come close to thinking about with the original system. It was, it was priority 500. Um, not that we didn't want people to see things, but if somebody doesn't see something in their feed, they probably won't notice. Um, though if somebody doesn't get a feed at all, if a build feed message fails, that's less good. So um, parts of the system, it is good to have reliability for. Um, this enormous, slightly daunting block of code is a spout definition in, in closure. Um, Storm is an, a Java system, but there's a DSL built on top of it. And this actually isn't as terrifying as it looks. Um, the stuff kind of down at the bottom, it all looks like uh, the same kind of thing you do when you implement a protocol um, with a, a type. Uh, and it is essentially the same thing. You're implementing um, Java methods. I believe it all blows up. It, it you know, demacroizes into a reify call. But spouts can have some state. We have, get a Redis up here, and then uh, this next tuple is the, the core, the only thing you absolutely have to implement. Um, and this one just reads from rescue, and it spits stuff off with a random ID that we, we generate. And that ID is uh, part of the reliability mechanism. If you provide an ID when, when you're emitting a spout, it'll essentially track the tuples that that ID creates across the, the, um, across the computational topology and then call either ACK or FAIL, depending on what happens. Bolts provide raw processing power. They receive tuples from streams. Um, they can have arbitrary logic. They can query databases. They can download the internet, whatever they want. They can carry state. So um, you can do things like build a, an aggregator that will wait for a bunch of different tuples. Um, and uh, you can guarantee that it will be in memory and, and persisted and all that. And then they emit tuples back to streams. Adding parallelism, adding more than one of these computational units, is literally adding colon p in the topology definition and then providing a number. I want 15 of these running across the cluster. Um, and so obviously it's somewhat easy to, to adjust. These are two bolt definitions, and these are a little cleaner than that spout, mostly because they don't have that that um, reliability stuff. The really simple bolt, uh, this is how we turn a feed into JSON. It, it just gets a tuple, and then it calls a serialized function that, that grabs the feed out of the tuple um, and uh, turns it into JSON and emits it. And actually, I left the emit thing. Um, you'll notice that both of these ACK the tuple that they got, and the reason they do that is to tie into the system that allows the spout to, uh, let, to call ACK or fail. Um, the second one is an example of a bolt with some state. It maintains a connection to a Redis database so that it doesn't have to do that every time it process, tries to process something. I'm going to talk real quickly, I don't even have the transitions here, with, about serialization, mostly because serialization is something you almost don't need to worry about when you're building your system. Um, when you're tuning your system, it, it, it is. Um, but it just works out of the box for the most part. Um, it falls back to Java serialization, which is dog slow, but I mean, it is there. So when you're developing, it's not a thing you need to uh, 
solve up front. You can actually solve your problem first and then worry about the details later. Um, there's a ton of power under the covers. Cryo is its own ecosystem of stuff, and um, it's, it's pretty cool. So this is the topology we built. Um, we have a Redis instance. We have the spout reading off it. Um, the spout emits to a user's tuple, and basically the user's tuple goes and finds all the users in the system, and then for each of those users, it emits a, uh, a bolt, or it, it emits a tuple. Um, uh, so for each of those t users, it emits a tuple, right? The tuple contains the user ID, and it contains the story. We have two other bolts, uh, these likes and follows scores, and they both subscribe to the user's tuple. They receive every single tuple that comes out of that. Um, they do a database lookup, um, and they give the story a score for that particular user. Those scores are then aggregated in this uh, reducer. Um, and so at the end of the, this, this reducer, the score maintains uh, a map with the, it's keyed on the ID and the story, and it just waits until it gets uh, scores for each of the, the scores in the system, and then it emits the final tuple into this feed builder. So it's kind of weird, I'm not sure if anybody actually remembers back to the other slide, but the feed building, Adam's inside Adam's thing that we built for the original system basically just moved over to this directly. It wasn't a bad system, it was just that when we tried to put, you know, a huge number of feeds in it, it used tons of memory. Um, and we needed to break it up across as many systems as we wanted to really actually make it inf infinitely scalable. Um, those, basically everything about that Adam and Adam thing with its expirer and its, its writer, it all stayed the same. Um, although I think we write inline now because we can. And so it writes it out to Redis. We just add parallelism as, as needed, and we kind of sprinkle it on top, and, um, and we go home. One thing that I didn't really talk about that enables this is that one of Storm's really cool features is that it allows you to define stream groupings. So these essentially ensure that, uh, in this particular case, we have the score kicking out tuples with user ID, story, and score and we put a stream grouping on, uh, of user ID story on this stream, that means that all tuples with the same user ID and story will go to the same in memory, the same memory space, um, the same bolt, the same processing bolt, um, which means we can safely maintain state in a single uh, place and, and they'll all get, uh, it'll, it'll get all the tuples that it cares about, not just some of them. They won't be distributed randomly, which is cool. And it enabled this. One of the cool things, I mean, I just showed you this diagram, but this is, this is translating that diagram into closure code. Um, we have the, the spout at the top, we have the users bolt, we have the likes and follows bolts, we actually have a seller follows bolt that I didn't include there. We have an interest reducer, and then we have this thing that adds stuff to feeds. Um, like I said, adding parallelism is literally just defining P, and then uh, you can see the, the various um, stream groupings defined within the bolt specs. And I mean, this, this is it, this is the whole thing. Um, one of the really nice things about this is that uh, a difficulty with closure is that coming from an object-oriented programming world, you're not really sure how to organize your code. Um, it's super flexible, you have a lot of options for code organization, and you know, the, the plethora of, of ways you could potentially organize things leads to different solutions, leads to, you know, doing things different ways in different uh, services. This provides a really nice way for us to think about the organization of the code. When you come into this code base, you look at this, you look up the various, um, the various Bolt implementations, and you can see directly how they're implemented, how the, how the system actually works. Super declarative, totally rocks. Uh, Storm also comes with uh, this cool UI. Um, it shows you the, summary, the topologies that are active, um, and then for each topology, it'll show you all sorts of stats about uh, the spouts, about the bolts, what the topology has been doing. Um, one neat thing is that once you get a storm cluster up, you can deploy as many topologies on it as you want. Um, so deploying you know, 14 different totally separate topologies is as simple as deploying one. Um, I mean, that's not at all true, but <laughs> let's, just, let's just go with it. It's, it's totally simple. Um, it, but it really is, it is pretty neat, and you know, not having to set up yet another Zookeeper to, 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 uh, to do this is gonna be nice. 
So awesome, success. Ooh, I gotta move this along. Um, but wait, we're still storing all the feeds in Redis. How do new feed builds happen? So it also has this, uh, Storm has this really cool uh, piece of functionality called uh, a DRPC server, distributed remote procedural calls. And essentially, it's a really simple thing that gets tacked onto to, to, uh, Storm. And it's a little server, it's a thrift server that receives requests from anybody and uh, pushes tuples out through a computational topology and then keeps track of everything that's generated by that topology. There's a bunch of magic, a bunch of coordination magic, um, and then and, and, uh, responses return to the DRP server, which then returns a response to the original client. Right, so that's me. <laughs> so we took this DRPC, this, this additional topology, we built another storm topology, because the recent actions thing in the build feed is just another storm topology. And we actually tacked it onto the original storm topology. They're all, it's all just apologies. So when somebody comes into the system, and they build a new feed, say they're coming for the first time. Um, we go look up recent actions, we build their feed, we return a response to them, but we also on the side kind of stick it, shunt it over to the original topology and stick it in their feed so that the next time they come into the system, they'll have a feed in Redis and they won't have to go through this DRPC server nonsense, um, which is great. Okay, so this, this is really cool. DRPC is, it's just Storm primitives. It, it's built on top of Storm. Um, it's pretty insane storm, and, and if you go look at the implementation, you'll, it's, it's pretty cool. There's a really good blog post from Ben Howard, I think is his name. I hope he's here because I wanna shake his hand. Um, uh, so it plays nice with the regular storm topology. You can connect the two together and they just work. I mean, seriously though, this is like, this is cool. This is really cool, and, and when we got it working, I was just like, erma gerd, um, because it was really, it works. So what does this mean? This means we can build feeds reliably, so, and we can build them quickly, so we don't have to store all the feeds in Redis anymore. We can just store feeds for active users in Redis, and it lets us cut our storage needs down by 95%, because 95% of our users haven't been on in the past like week, right? So, cool. We can shut down these massive red eye. We, we can build a, a more reliable, more scalable system, and we can easily, extend this in the future. We can add uh, you know, machine learning stuff in additional scores, and it's pretty clear how we would make it better. Yes! It works. Um, you know, we, we have this in production now. It all works. It's doing the right thing. Um, it's really remarkably cleaner than the old system, and it's, it, it was just, it's one of those moments where you step back from the system that you just deployed, and you're really happy with it, which is, uh, which is pleasant. Closure rocks. I mean, it was really good for this. Uh, it allowed us to add easy parallelism to even the original system, but also through, you know, Storm. Um, the code ended up really pretty clean. It's, it's easy to come into the system and understand kind of what's going on, and, and it's clear, there's a clear path to understanding the whole system. Um, there are libraries available, thanks to Java. Um, when you need a library, uh, you, somebody's implemented it in Java. Might not be super idiomatic, but it's there. Um, and it's fast and capable. You know, it, it, we were reasonably happy with the performance. We, were, we knew we were doing horrible things, so um, can't complain. And people build stuff like Storm. Um, I mean, the stuff that's being built in Clojure, um, the, the old abstractions that are being dredged up from you know, the, the bowels of computer science and, and the new abstractions that are being built on top of it, it it's pretty cool. Um, the, the power to build domain-specific languages, to build stuff like this, it's, um, I, I think a lot of people are going to be excited about that in talks up here over the next couple days, but it, I'll just put my plug in too. It, it's really neat. Mostly, I mean, every, everything has some failings. Mature idiomatic library support is a little wanting. Um, there is a lot of really interesting work going on there. The Closure Works guys, I don't know what they're doing, but they, they have like 40 different libraries and they're all pretty idiomatic. They're getting to mature. And, and so we use some of them and we're pretty happy with some of them, but you still do have to sometimes fix bugs in the libraries that you try to use. Um, which, you know, it's not so bad, so bad. The JVM is totally the worst. It's, it's horrible, it's a pain in the ass, but, you know, everything else is even worse. So, what are you gonna do? Um, laziness will totally bite you at some point. I love laziness, huge fan of it. But, you know, when you're working with a lot of stateful databases and you're doing, you're making a fair number of, of calls that don't necessarily return a value, they're not pure functions, it's gonna bite you. 
Um, it'll lead to some frustration, but whatever, it's not that big a deal. Um, best practices for code, or, code organization, polymorphism, um, it, they're in their infancy. Um, we're getting there, it's just the place we need to go. But it rocks. Um, still my favorite language after a significant project, blood, sweat, tears. Uh, the number of times something just worked was refreshing. Uh, it storms a great example of how Clojure can bring a language to a domain. Seriously, awesome. Good times. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Rich Hickey, Nathan Mars, the conjure organizers, Rob Zuber, uh, one of our engineers who also happens to be the CTO, Cobius for letting this happen, and um, we're hiring. So, you know, <laughs> come talk to me. Um, I'm T. Vashon on Twitter, Travis at Cobius.com, and that's it. Thank you.